uh, we will start the discussion. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the time is uh, a little pressing, so uh, we've decided that the initial statement uh, from six people will not be seven minutes, but five minutes, please. Point one. Point two. You may have already prepared statements. However, if I may say, let's not analyze Ukrainian war. Let's not predict what will happen. No one can really make prediction. Let's concentrate on what should be done, who should do it, like Turkey, China has weighed in, United Nations tried to do it, but not really have done it. Uh, EU could maybe could do it. Let's see who should do, do what, when. Uh, the, let's focus on these issues rather than repeating a lot of analysis, if you would agree. Uh, this is the first time I'm speaking with panelists. It's not easy, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, Gendong NPO, you know, is always unprepared. Uh, just uh, start from here, and that's why it's interesting. So uh, please. Uh, uh, and uh, I will start uh, from the speakers list. Uh, Fabrice from uh, NATO will be the first speaker, and uh, followed by Jim Lindsay from United States. But uh, uh, I will not introduce. You, you have the list already. So uh, let's start from Fabrice please. Thank you very much. And I like the way you completely disrupted the, the panel. I think that's the way to go. And I'm trying to try to be uh, uh, true to your, to your more disruptive approach. So first, as a disclaimer, I don't come neutral in that conversation um, in the sense that I have been advising uh, President Zelensky and his team since uh, last year, last spring, on um, initially a very specific topic of security guarantees with Mr. Rasmussen and a group of experts, including Lord Haig. Uh, and from that relationship developed uh, a broader uh, uh, relationship where I and my company, Rasmussen Global, we support pro bono uh, President Zelensky and his team on, on a range of issues going from security guarantees to reconstruction. So this is important uh, to, to, to be clear about that. Um, let, me, let me make two points. First, what does peace mean? Because I saw in the language proposed by Genron this notion that we should have peace as soon as possible. Well, I, and I was a bit worried about that statement. I think it's more what kind of peace do we need to have to have real peace? Uh, and I think that's very important. And I would take the perspective of the Ukrainians uh, without speaking for them, but knowing them. Um, first, it is very important to realize, however difficult it is, that the solution to date is still a military solution. And I know that diplomats like to talk about there is no military solution, but there is only a diplomatic one. No. The solution for the moment is a military one. And until both parties reach a certain point, there is not going to be a diplomatic or political engagement that would be meaningful. So that's, and we're still in the military sequence right now. However, what does peace mean, especially from a Kiev point of view? First, it means territorial dimension. And it's a highly emotional question. Uh, I often hear in Western capitals, oh, well, you know, if they were to make some concessions on this and on that oblast and on Crimea, you know, we'll be all fine. Uh, we should not underestimate how now the Ukrainian territory has become full part of the Ukrainian identity, which actually has been partly created by Vladimir Putin's repeated invasion of Ukraine. Uh, 
Um, and if you look at the last IRA uh, polling of Ukrainian opinion on the war, you see a big majority in favor of a full recovery of the, the Ukrainian territory. And what is important to know is President Zelensky's magic, his political genius, is that he understands his audience. He's an actor, meaning that he's not necessarily the one telling Ukrainian people what they should know. He's actually more the one who reflects what he thinks Ukrainian, the majority of Ukrainians think and want. And there has been a hardening of the Ukrainian population's view about what does post-war Ukraine mean, including from a territorial point of view. So we, we have to, to understand that perspective. Second, there cannot be peace without some modicum of security guarantees. You have, again, to proceed from the psychology of the Ukrainians who feel that they have been betrayed by a a Budapest memorandum, which obviously is not even worth the paper it was signed on, and B, a promise that was so ambiguous in 2008 in Bucharest by the NATO leaders that Ukraine will become a member, but not yet, that actually that ambiguity offered a huge gap that Vladimir Putin is still exploiting today. So there's this notion that we cannot have a repeat of a third Russian war against Ukraine, and therefore, we do need some security guarantees. Obviously, the ideal one being Article 5 of uh, the uh, North Atlantic Alliance. But short of, of that, some sort of new creative security guarantees with some guarantors uh, that will provide everything that Ukraine needs to exert its Article 51 right for self-defense. That's another uh, very important element of what does peace mean. And, and what's interesting is President Zelensky doesn't see security guarantee as a war chest. He sees that as a demographic and as a, an economic policy. Because only with credible security guarantees, a large portion of his population will return to Ukraine and work in Ukraine and a large portion of the internally displaced people will return to their home and again uh, also uh, engage in, in, in economic activities. And it's also key to reconstruction. Uh, private investors are reluctant to engage now or even I think if there were to be some sort of peace settlement in Ukraine unless they have a guarantee that this is not going to happen again that the investment is not going to be destroyed by the next Iran, Iranian uh, drones launched by the Russian forces. So security guarantees have a bigger connotation than just security. It's about basically rebuilding an economy and a demography. And finally, and this is, yes, I'm finishing, this is a very important point, accountability and reparation. Uh, we should not underestimate the uh, importance for not just the Ukrainian leadership, but the Ukrainian population of international justice, accountability and reparation. And this is obviously a huge task and it's a contradiction with a real politic of having a peace settlement or a resolution with the Russians. But after Bucha, and I've been to Bucha, and Prime Minister Kishida went to Bucha, and after many other acts, including more than 15,000 Ukrainian children who have been literally kidnapped and now are in some kind of black hole of hell by the Russians, after those acts that are not just cr war crimes, but they are a crime of aggression and genocide, after those acts, without justice, there won't be peace. So this is just to lay out what peace means from the, the other side. And just to finish, I think one other missing piece to, to how we look at Ukraine is what's our strategy towards Russia. And it is quite, uh, I would say, um, unsettling to see the leader in the effort to support Ukraine, the US, unwilling to engage in the thinking both at NATO or even outside NATO about what's a strategy towards Russia. And I think the bottom line here is simple. We have to make a difference between the regime, whose behavior is obviously unacceptable and has to be contained, it's an aggressive behavior, and Russia, the country. And when French diplomats 
say that we have to accept that Russia is part of the European geography and therefore there will have to be some sort of settlement, including with Russia, I think they are being uh, intellectually lazy. And instead, there should be a clear difference made between a regime who has no place into a stable Europe and Russia, the nation who can be great without having imperialist ambitions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I haven't met uh, uh, President uh, Zelensky like uh, you have, but uh, watching from television, I'm always impressed because uh, he's so small, surrounded by giants, and all, but he has the leader's aura, and uh, his message sent is always uh, exact, and I'm very impressed. Jim Lindsay uh, has been always guiding us with saying that the definition of peace should be just and unequitable, and uh, territorial integrity is important, so uh, he has already uh, touched up on that, but uh, I'd like you to uh, sort of lead us on uh, where uh, we should be doing more against Russia or Ukraine. And uh, also, uh, sorry, but we are running out of time. So please make time, uh, your uh, remarks short, please, as well. Well, I hear you're, my You are very good at it, so. I authorize you to cut me off mid-sentence, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, again, I would echo a lot of what Fabrice just said. I do think the terms of the peace matter and matter a lot. I think any peace settlement that rewards Russian aggression sets a very dangerous precedent that we will come to regret. I also agree with Fabrice that right now uh, the focus is on the military front. I don't think the conditions are ripe uh, for diplomacy. I think for the West, if I may use that term, the challenge right now is sustaining uh, ample military support for Ukraine in the face of President Putin's clear commitment to wage the war. Uh, there are lots of calls so, so, for... Sorry, Jim, so you think the Chinese proposal is not a good one at this juncture? I do not think the Chinese proposal is a proposal. It's a list of platitudes. Thank you very so much. put it that way. Please continue. Okay. Uh, so I think the challenge now is maintaining uh, adequate military support for Ukraine. There are lots of discussions about what the right level of support, what the right weapons are. If you want to go in Q&A, we can dive into uh, that question. Uh, but I think the challenge really facing the West right now is it has to understand Mr. Putin's theory of the case. Mr. Putin thought last February he was going to take Ukraine very quickly. He failed. He still believes he will take Ukraine. He believes his price he's going to pay is going to be much harder, but he is willing to pay that higher price. He believes that Russia can outlast the West. He believes that the West will eventually tire of its support for Ukraine. The West will cease to provide the level of weapons that the Ukrainians need. When that happens, the Russian military will be able to change the facts on the ground, and Russia will win. So the problem is, for anyone sort of proposing negotiations is, uh, even sort of pro uh, proposing talks can be read by the Kremlin as confirming President Putin's theory of the case that the West really wants to get out of this war. So rather than making a negotiated settlement more likely, it could end up making a negotiated settlement less likely. Uh, I think one of the big things to pay attention to going forward is a debate in the United States, because I think it's pretty clear. We saw in the last session uh, that the United States has been uh, pivotal. I don't want to use the word indispensable, though it was used in the last session, in being able to mobilize countries in the West to act. And I think there's been a lot of questions raised as to whether or not the United States will sustain its commitment to Ukraine in the coming years. I think for the remainder of the Biden administration, uh, you will have that support. Obviously, if you had a change in the presidency, if President Trump were to return, based on his public statements, U.S. policy toward Ukraine uh, would change dramatically. I do think there is one country that has the capacity to change the current dynamic, uh, and that would be China. Uh, but instead, it is enabling and not pressing Moscow to negotiate. Uh, I think that was true if you go back a year ago in the 
uh, two weeks before the invasion where uh, President Xi spoke about a strategic partnership without limits. Uh, that commitment remains true today, just this week, being in I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you don't think the United Nations can have a little bit more role? No, I do not, for the simple reason that the UN Security Council has to operate by unanimity. It has five veto-wielding uh, members. Uh, my sense is that the Russians can be counted on uh, to veto any resolution not in their interest. The Secretary General is obviously in a very difficult position given that in some sense, his board of directors uh, is split on this issue. This is a general problem with the United Nations. It can work uh, when the leading powers can come to agreement on a course of action. Uh, when they don't, then it is uh, immobilized. And I think, again, going back to uh, the issue of China, China has had multiple opportunities to sort of get off the uh, highway of geopolitical competition and has refused to take every exit. And I think that basically means it is perpetuating the fighting in Ukraine, but it's also deepening the broader divisions that we've been talking about at this conference and creating a much more dangerous world. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jim Lindsay has uh, spoken that the Russian strategy or tactic is to make uh, Western side tired. And so it's a race of uh, endurance, en enduring race. And uh, some people were predicting that Germany are the sort of, uh, with Hungary and some others are the weak link in, and, uh, because it's so dependent on Russian energy compared to others. However, uh, Germany is standing up uh, very strongly. And uh, uh, can you say uh, something about uh, this and... Uh, uh, Germany's uh, uh, position and uh, uh, Stephen Sun, please. Yeah, I can. And, and I think so far we have taken really a clear position and we don't depend anymore on the Russian energy. We have reduced this uh, drastically uh, within a very short uh, time. We got uh, close to 60% of our gas from Russia uh, before the war started and we are now almost down to zero. Uh, within really a very um, uh, short period of time, with the assistance, of course, for, of the Americans, but also with the assistance of some other countries. And uh, I think, so far, we are very much determined, really, to maintain um, the support we uh, gave to uh, Ukraine, uh, just to, I think, uh, attract your attention to the kind of sea change we had in Germany, that we deliver now even uh, tanks uh, to a country which is in a interstate conflict with another country is for Germany with its more or less pacifist uh, tradition in the past uh, 20, 30 years, a real major uh, decision. I'm, but I'm also very much concern, uh, concerned about perhaps an increasing war fatigue uh, we might get in Europe. Uh, uh, when you look at, uh, at the news, uh, Ukraine is uh, slowly disappearing from the top 10 um, uh, in the news. I think this certainly um, is an, an um, somehow demonstrating that this might be the case. And, and of course, I'm very much concerned about uh, um, the outcome of the presidential elections in the United States in 24. We had uh, um, statements uh, both by DeSantis and by Trump, uh, who I think regard this uh, assistance given so far uh, to Ukraine at least as being excessive, or at least Europe should uh, shoulder the same, the same burden as. Uh, as uh, um, as the United States, which we certainly do to a certain degree because uh, it's not only the military assistance, it's also the financial burden we have and we uh, both Poland uh, and also Germany, um, we welcomed uh, almost close to one million uh, refugees uh, in, in our countries. So I think um, the risk of war fatigue is, uh, is there. But let me also make a, a few remarks on what um, um, you said and, and I completely agree that uh, it's not the right time for negotiations. Uh, and it's not true that uh, wars can only be ended by negotiations. Uh, I represent a country which was defeated. Uh, uh, we um, um, had to unconditionally surrender at the end uh, of the war. Japan is another uh, example for that. So wars can be ended by military defeat. The problem is only we didn't have nuclear weapons at that time. And um, to defeat a nuclear power is very difficult. Uh, and so we have to think about what can be a defeat. Uh, but that uh, 
uh, Russia has to give up on its war um, goals is, I think, quite uh, obvious to me. Uh, unfortunately, Putin still seems to think that he can achieve them. And uh, to be clear about that, it's not only about uh, seizing territory in, uh, in Ukraine or having regime change uh, in Ukraine. His war goal is also to establish Russia as an authoritarian power in a hegemonic role in Europe. That's, that's his ultimate war goal. And uh, that means that this war is very important also to, for the rest of Europe, not only for Ukraine, and that we have to maintain the support we have given so far. Um, one last sentence on what you said at the end, um, Fabrice, on uh, we have to separate the regime from um, the Russian people. And I think this is not that easy, because there is a significant support for imperialistic policies and sentiments in the Russian uh, population. When you look at uh, the opinion polls at the beginning of the war you, uh, war, you could see that. And there is still a strong imperialistic attitude. And uh, so we have to think about, if you have a new Russia, how to deal with this. Um, uh, and uh, so we, it's not that easy that we can say, here is the regime which is bad, and here are the people uh, who are good. Um, there is, I think, a strong interlinkage between both. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay San. About uh, Indian uh, situation, uh, uh, on one side, India has uh, military re relations with uh, Russia, uh, getting S-400 and uh, also uh, uh, having a uh, uh, the uh, December uh, 2021, uh, Putin visited India and extended uh, military technical cooperation for 10 years. However, on the other side, India is concerned about these territorial integrity being uh, attacked by China. So uh, uh, India has abstained in the initial vote in the uh, United Nations. and uh, But uh, all in all, I think uh, India is more sympathetic to Ukraine position, uh, but uh, it's in a rather delicate situation. Can you explain a bit and also tell us uh, how we should move from here as well? No, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Chair, for uh, putting these questions. Uh, let me first, uh, I think your, the, the preliminary question you asked the entire panel has already been answered. What are the prospects for peace? You heard that this is not the time for peace. Uh, so I don't think we, can, we should be debating that anymore. Uh, let me move ahead uh, and get down to the question which you asked me. What is the Indian position? I don't speak for the Indian government. I speak from my own perceptions of what uh, the debate in India has been about and what not only people in India, but a lot of people in the global south seem to think about this war. They do not see this as one war being fought in Ukraine. Actually, what is being fought in Ukraine are multiple wars, at least two, if not three wars. The first war is the war you mentioned, which is a violation of the UN Charter. And as far as the Indian position is, there is no question about it. Every violation of the UN Charter is a problem. We do not support it. We do not support Russia in this violation. And India has persistently made this stand, that Russian aggression against Ukraine can, under no circumstances, be condoned. I think that is a very, very clear position. The nuances in the Indian position actually come, uh, from my understanding, is because this is not the only war which is being fought over Ukraine. Unfortunately, Ukrainian lives are being lost. Ukrainian cities are being devastated by at least another two wars being fought with, with the lives of Ukrainians. There we have a problem. And the consequences of those wars are being borne not only by Ukraine, but by many other countries across the world, because in this war, this has become a kind of total war where everything has become an instrument of war. The banking system, energy flows, food and fertilizer flows, there is nothing which is off limits. We are using weapons which no Geneva Convention controls. And as far as the use of weapons goes, I mean, the collateral damage from these weapons spreads far and wide. And this war is about larger things. Excuse the, me, Sanjay-san. You said uh, first war, second war, third, third war. war. But uh, 
Let me let me explain the no, second just, just my question. No, it's important S to my thesis. The second or third war yeah. had to take place because of the first war, isn't it? No, the second war is basically about the future of the international order or where it should be headed. Yeah. You cannot revise the international order in the battlefields of Ukraine. Let's, let's stop talking about that. And you cannot frame the contest between Russia and the West in terms of this war. So when that becomes a proxy war, there's a problem. And when that proxy war starts getting fought using Ukrainian lives, there's a bigger problem. Do you Please fight your wars yourselves. I'm sorry, do, do, not, you do not spill Ukrainian blood in these wars. I'm sorry, so, uh, my question is, do you take it as a proxy war? Do you think if it the, is, if, it the, is. If, the, if the if the first, uh, first war is uh, not occurred, the second or if the second war or third war is not not fought, then how it would the first war would prevail, doesn't it? The, no. The solution to all these three, I see. actually all these three wars, is simple. See, and that is exactly what we're discussing. That you want peace or you want pieces. At the moment we are saying we can't have peace. We're content to live with pieces. We're content to live with fragmentation. In this kind of fragmentation, and everyone agrees that ultimately you will have to get down to a table to negotiate. And the conclusion we have heard from all the speakers is that this is not the time for negotiation. Now, what is the time for negotiation? The problem arises that you know, we talk about this is not the time to end the war. Now, start looking at other wars. Again, a lot of unilateral actions taken by various other members of the P5. Look at the war in Iraq. Look at the war in Afghanistan. In 20 years, you could not degrade the capabilities of a completely disorganized tribal force called the Taliban. And you hope that you will bring Russia to the negotiating table in the next one year, two years, five years, I do not know when you will bring them on table by degrading their capabilities. You're talking of degrading the capabilities not of an Islamic state. You're not talking of degrading the capabilities of a Taliban, but of a country which is not just the 11th largest economy in the world, which is the font of so many resources, which supplies resources, which is, which is critical to certain elements of the entire global chain, whether it is food, whether it is fertilizer, whether it is energy, yes, you have a problem there. You have a real problem there. Because this kind of degradation is going to take years and years and years, and therefore, what we are seeing is a prospect of a frozen conflict in the heart of Europe, and of Afghanistan and Syria and Europe, which is going to be paid for by Ukrainian lives. So there, yes, we have a problem. We do not agree. And countries in the South are worried about this war. They're worried about this war because it is upturning a, a settled form of geopolitics. It, see, it is also, in many ways, created a world in which globalization is at an end. And there are countries, you are ranged against China. China has emerged as one of the players in this conflict. And the Chinese peace plan will not succeed simply because the world does not trust China. It may be a good plan, it may be a bad plan, but that plan is a non-starter. So that plan becomes an instrument to prolong the war, not to shorten it. Sanjay, -san, do you think it's a time of negotiation? From what I'm hearing about from the table, it is not. You. That, that's exactly what I See, there is no time for negotiation. Some, ultimately, some critical party, some, some third party, a trusted party, a trusted interlocutor has to come in, or a group of interlocutors have to come in. Is Otherwise, that, this war is going to continue. Is Japan, that, Japan is, a, is India? at India, Japan, <laughs> Indonesia. Okay. Okay. A lot of countries can right. come forward. And, okay. But, but yeah. see, Make this will not, this, none of this is going to succeed until, see, multilateralism will not succeed until the big players in the multilateral order tend to agree to a course of action. This is not going to happen in isolation. Right. OK, thank you very much. I sort of uh, understand, but at the same time, still think that uh, if we don't fight the second or third war, the aggressor in the first war will win. But uh, still, uh, I, I got your point. So I think uh, all of us, uh, like uh, other countries like India, Indonesia, or Japan, should involve themselves more directly. Uh, I take your point. Now, uh, Thomas, on, uh, France, uh, uh, is there a fatigue uh, in France as well? Uh, how is the situation? Can you tell us a bit about France and also about general, where about the, uh, if we should start negotiations or not as well? 
Thank you. French people is never tired. Uh, three points, if, if I may. Um, the very first one, Cher, if it's to say that I disagree uh, over the title of this session, One Year of War in Ukraine. In fact, it's nine years of war in Ukraine. This war, this war started, you know, in February 2014. And uh, I, made this, I, I, I make this point because in terms of analysis to try to produce peace, it's very important because uh, the lack of reaction of the so-called international community in 2014 uh, could explain uh, the attitude, for instance, of China regarding Hong Kong or Macau. So I think that it's important to understand and not to be only focused on Ukraine, but to see the consequences of this conflict related to the situation in the Middle East between uh, Iran, Israel, and Saudi Arabia, for instance, or regarding the situation in the China Sea as well. There are interconnections, which, uh, in my opinion, are very, very visible. What does it mean, nine years of war? First one, it, it is to say that uh, President Putin is able of uh, strategic patience. He was able to wait for eight years before uh, decided to take another level of intensity by his uh, special military operation, which was supposed to produce a regime change in um, 62 hours. So now the Russian military is completely deadlocked uh, in Ukraine. It shows also the level of resilience, the level of resistance, the level of preparation by the Ukrainian army which uh, used its strategic time between 2014 and 2022. So it's a lesson for all of us in terms of uh, moral forces. Point number two, um, I think that what is new with this uh, February 2002 invasion, it is a nuclear dimension of the crisis. On that, I would disagree maybe with, um, with Stefan. We, in, in the past, we had nuclear powers which were uh, defeated. The US in Vietnam or uh, the USSR in Afghanistan. In France and Vietnam too. Right, but we, at that time we don't have, you know, the, the, the nuclear weapons. Oh. The nuclear weapon, it's uh, uh, 1962, Ambassador. I'm sorry. No, no, no worry. Um, so it's important to have this, this, this remind. Uh, I do believe that we are indeed in the military sequence. Uh, so now we have uh, three scenarios, three basic scenarios regarding you know, the coming weeks and the coming months. The first one is a complete um, Ukrainian military victory, which seems to me unlikely. The second one is a complete Russian military victory, which seems to me more unlikely. And the third one is a partial um, Ukrainian victory, which seems to me the most likely. But certainly not in the, in the frontier of uh, 2014. So what does it mean? That means that, yes, Ukraine will need uh, security guarantees. And on both sides, certainly, there will uh, maybe a ceasefire, which would be a, a way to stop a direct combat, but certainly the preparation for a new phase. So that means that for Europe, uh, Russia, unfortunately, I say that because it's uh, a country in which I worked very extensively uh, during my professional life, uh, will be a, a danger for, for Europe for at least one or two decades. And we should be prepared to face that. Russia has strategic depth, more strategic depth than Ukraine. Russia does think that the transatlantic unity uh, will be weakened after the election of 2024. But Russia was completely surprised by this transatlantic unity, uh, underestimate, you know, uh, the um, transatlantic um, support, and uh, was misled in, his, in its reading of uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Point number three, what can be done, obviously, to support Ukraine and Ukrainians, but also, I think, to try to address the Russian people. 
and to make a distinction between Russian regime and Russia and Russians. And that's something on which would be much more sophisticated. It's to try to, uh, to explain that if there are sanctions, these sanctions can be left if there is an evolution, a political evolution. Sanctions are not here for eternity. And the problem of the West is to sanction all the time and to be not able to lift sanctions. So more we sanction without explaining why and that sanction could be lifted, the more we, we push uh, Russian people in the corner. Final point, uh, what can be done by uh, other players? I do expect a lot you know, from SCO members, especially from India. Because is a, is a global south makes sense, which is something debatable, um, I think that the global south should take this opportunity to get credibility and to pressure Russia. Because in terms of the UN, UN Charter, there is absolutely no doubt about where the aggression is coming from. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very interesting point uh, about global south. Uh, at the same time, France and Germany, uh, France is a uh, uh, UN Security Council member and uh, together with Germany have uh, uh, sort of démarché or, uh, on uh, Putin several times, uh, uh, President Macron. Do you think uh, France can play some role there as well? Well, the Minsk process, you know, cannot be seen as a success, to say the least. So yeah, we not, try. We I'm try. I'm not talking about the Minsk, but after. No, no, let, let me yeah, try yeah, to explain yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. Because until you know, eighth uh, of February, uh, both uh, France and Germany use all the diplomatic means to try to uh, avoid uh, this um, decision taken by President Putin. So now it's a completely new phase. And I think that, of course, France and Germany can take initiative, but now also uh, including from, from the beginning, you know, other capitals, I, I, I speak about, you know, London and Warsaw, which were more accurate regarding the Russian threats than uh, Paris and Berlin in the last months. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas. And the, uh, we had the six initial speakers in the the last one is Kudosan. Uh, the uh, Kudosan is the last initial speaker, and after that, uh, any panelist could uh, jump in and uh, express th their views. And then, if there's time, I would like to open up for questions because uh, there are so many pundits here uh, who could be the panelists themselves. So, uh, uh, but Kudosan first, please. Hi. <coughs> I'm not a military expert, but having listened to your comments, the following is my impression. What is the purpose of military support? We don't want Ukrainians to be defeated. We want them to defeat. And Russia, we want to trouble Russia. If we wanted Russia to win, then or Ukraine to win, the military support would have been bigger, uh, including possibility of delivering fighter planes. Is your thoughts fixed on that? And currently, economic sanctions are being imposed, and we are trying to de-incentivize Russia to fight. But from the global perspective, it may seem that it's just the West that's fighting, and people are sitting on the sides. It's not, not, it's not that all the countries feel ownership. This all started by violation of UN Charter, and they invaded a territory of another country. And this is a case of all the whole world trying to inhibit that. That's what the UN Charter is all about, and that in itself has dysfunctioned. And that ought to be the global common interest. So at least for Asia, Prime Minister Kishida went there and at the Abbey he visited. That scene reminded the Japanese people regarding the fury over the invasion by Russia. So we have to halt Russia's action, but it can't be 
some lukewarm solution because if we allow a lukewarm solution, then that will give time to Russia and they may invade again. So I think it has to be a deterministic solution. So then uh, the only thing we can rely on is the UN function. And as Mr. Lindsay has pointed out, it's dysfunctioned. That's true. We can't have high hopes because at the Security Council, the permanent members are there. So I think we should make the decision at the UNGA. Suez uh, confusion of 1960s, can't we repeat that? UN General Assembly. Yes, after we come up with an environment of ceasefire negotiations under certain conditions, the UN forces should step in through the endorsement of the General Assembly. Is that possible, do you think? I don't have a clear image, but there's one possible avenue, and that is the repetition of the Cambodian PKO. Japan, China, and Germany at the UNGA you know, I'm talking about after the ceasefire negotiations and ceasefire be beginning to be implemented. But three countries went in and make a proposal to send the PKO. That may be really an outlier, a proposal. Germany joining Japan participation and PLA of China also joining. I think our scenario has to be that big, or else we can't hope for any deterministic solution. Then is there likelihood? I last year negotiated with the Chinese. And when I negotiated with the Chinese, when I said that, they understood. They understood everything. They said, for your honor, Mr. Kudo, don't, I won't criticize the UN forces, because if China at this stage there's no likelihood for the PLA to join. That's what they said. But why do I, did I bring that up in my conversation with the Chinese? It's because we did a survey of the gen Chinese general public last year. Ukraine's invasion, what do you think? And the Chinese respondents, half of them said they are against. Further, there was a secret question. For the end of the Ukrainian aggression, what do you think about PKO? dispatching, would you cooperate? 60% of the Chinese responses says, yes, we are in support of such idea. So this may be really unbased at all without no realization factors, but is there no will for PKO, that country? You think that China is like uh, Russia, uh, maybe wanting to expand its territory. No, it's not the case. There are those factors within China who think so. So how do we rebuild order? That's what I'm thinking. Sorry, you may think that I'm uh, just very unrealistic, but I want to make my bet on that avenue. You may find it meaningless, but if there is any way we can build an ecosystem, uh, that may be the only way. And I think uh, we in the civil society should make such efforts. Thank you so much. We have five members, Singapore, Brazil, UK, Canada, Italy, in any sequence. Limit yourself to two minutes, the UK. Crayon, son, please go ahead. And uh, next, Paul Simon from Canada. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, firstly, just to say I agree a great deal with what um, the other um, think tank experts have said in the sense that uh, there are a number of different ways the conflict could end. Clearly, um, <clears throat> whatever the ending point, we'll have to have the support of the Ukrainian public. Um, but, but what that will entail, there could be a number of different scenarios. However, I wanted to make two, two points that haven't been made so far. One is about the importance of the reconstruction process once the conflict ends. Uh, and this is important because although this is not going to be a complete security guarantee, it can be a very important part of Ukraine's long-term security if its reconstruction is successful, if its economy is successful, if its uh, democratic process is successful once the conflict is over. 
Personally, I'm actually really quite optimistic about what Ukraine could achieve, and there are a number of factors for this. One is the EU accession process, which provides a kind of overarching framework, and would be one of the things that prevents, if you like, a reversion to, uh, if you like, the, the corruption of the past. Secondly, as I think was already pointed out, if you look at what happened between 2014 and 2022, there were really some quite remarkable reforms that took place in Ukraine, even though, I think externally, uh, it didn't seem as if so much was happening. One was in the military, but you can see it in the health service, you can see it in the financial sector, and so on. And if anything, my perception is that, um, as a consequence of the conflict, there is, there is a, a really important group of technocrats, of people who are in the parliament who are absolutely determined that Ukraine in the future will not revert to what it was in the past. Now, if it is a successful economy and a successful democracy, that then can underpin uh, military forces. And we can see in other parts of the world where countries in that sort of frozen situ situation can nonetheless have very strong, powerful military forces, particularly if supported through the kind of NATOization of the armed forces. Second point I just quickly wanted to make was about sanctions. Now, sanctions. Sanctions again, uh, when they were when it was first proposed, you know there was some question about is this punishment, is this deterrence? But as soon as Ukraine showed it could resist, the sanctions became a very very crucial part of helping Ukraine win in some sense. And because of the threshold that President Putin had crossed, in terms of the the flagrant violation of the. UN Charter, there was an enormous degree of unity within the G7 that enabled completely unprecedented range of sanctions to be imposed. And I think personally that in the, even in the medium term, uh, these will be very important in the eventual outcome because if you look at Russia's situation, the brain drain, the lack of finance, the lack of technology, this is all um, very, very damaging to the Russian long, medium to long-term economic prospects. And I can't see how that won't have some role, at least, in the eventual outcome. But finally, on sanctions, I do think uh, once the conflict is over, the West has to think through, you know, what it was all done very quickly and for very good reasons. But there are a lot of, un, if you like, unintended consequences. And we do need to think through what those are and how we can manage them. I also would say that you know, if there is any part of Ukrainian territory still occupied by Russia, there will have to be some kind of price for that. Uh, and sanctions will most likely be part of the price that Russia continues to pay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by saying that the, uh, the main speakers here, I think, did a really interesting and good job on, the, on setting the stage in the analysis here. I'm going to pick up on two points. Um, the first one is that if this is truly the multipolar order that's already here, which I would agree with, um, and that it is a proxy war to broader issues, which I would also agree with, um, it is a moment for a new country to step forward. Now, granted that we're still in a military stage, but at some point there is a diplomatic stage. I, I think if you look at the G7 countries, there isn't a single one there that could credibly be the broker ultimately here, right? It's difficult for Japan because of history with Russia. Even for a country like Canada that has stepped up sometimes in these situations, it's not, it's not the time to do that. It's not the right situation. European countries, very difficult. United States is not the right broker ultimately here, nor is China, I would argue. So that shifts quickly to other countries. Um, and I think there is a very interesting opportunity for other G20 large southern countries, let me go no further in naming them, but you could name them, um, to say, is this a moment we actually want to step forward and say it is a new multipolar world and you know, and we're the right one to help broker this, recognizing that we have our own interests as well. So that's point one. Point two would be on the question of supply chains, technology, you know, the endurance war with Russia. I'm not totally convinced uh, that they can sustain as long as they're pretending to. 
It reminds me a little bit of Silicon Valley Bank saying everything is fine. Um, and then, you know, very suddenly it's not, right? So it's not clear to me, I, others may have the evidence, that Russia is actually able to get the technology it needs and the other things that are, that are part of the reality of just keeping a modern economy going. 11th largest economy in the world is actually not very big, if you ask me. And if you fall from that position, um, that's a bad place for Russia to be. And so they're, they're actually quite vulnerable. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, uh, Carlos and Onken san and Netro san. Uh, 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 Carlos san, please. Yes. Oh. Oh, my. I start by putting a question. Suppose, just for the sake of argument, that Russia wins the war and that Ukraine is absorbed by Russia again. Do you think that, can anyone think reasonably that within 10 years, the effect of 40 million people that have lived 30 years under democ uh, democracy will not be felt in Russia? Do you think that uh, Putin's regime will keep it the same way it is? Probably by absorbing Ukraine, Russia will have a lot of trouble and could even fragment. So this is my first remark. Uh, if Russia, Russia loses a war, then who knows? Putin may react with nuclear weapons. It's too dangerous a game to bet. So this is my point. The, the conundrum is there. Uh, there was a similar conundrum here in Korea 70 years ago. Uh, there are two coalitions in the world. One is China, basically, with, with Russia now. And another coalition, which is made by the United States and its major allies. Uh, China is cannibalizing Russia, actually. It's buying energy, minerals at a lower price than it should be, than they should be. And it's exporting to Russia what Russia cannot buy from other countries. So China is making a very good business. Does it have an interest to end the thing very fast? I don't believe so. Uh, on the other hand, for the American coalition, there is a problem. If Russia fragments, okay, if it becomes democratic or so too fast, even if it fragments and part of the fragmentation would be the European part of Russia that gets most of the nuclear weaponry, it is natural that it would converge to Europe, and that would make the American coalition unstable. Believe me. Germany and Russia will have a tendency to get closer, a democratic Russia and a democratic Germany. Why not? So this is a very difficult game where you have to consider that maybe, just maybe, the most stable solution, this is very sad to say, but the most stable solution would be a stalemate. The problem is how do you negotiate a stalemate without losing face, using a, an Asian expression. No side can lose face. This is a big problem. Uh, thank you very much. I think we have to be thinking about those far-reaching issues uh, and uh, speaking in a very broad terms like you have just presented is important. And uh, as for nuclear, often people would just say, as Gorbachev and Reagan said, no, there's no winner in nuclear war. But that's wrong. If the two sides are nuclear power, there's no winner. But if the only one side is nuclear power, it could be a winner as well. So we have to be very careful on this issue. And uh, I think, uh, Ettore san, you had, uh, please. Uh, many, many thanks. Uh, I think, first of all, let me stress uh, that in the case of this uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, lack, uh, uh, neutrality is uh, probably a, la a luxury that we cannot afford. 
that's certainly a case uh, of uh, uh, European states that have remained uh, very united. That uh, should be stress in supporting Ukraine. That was not taken for granted, you may remember, at the beginning uh, of the war. And we were also able to uh, be capable of uh, un uniting uh, in the front of some uh, very existential threats, including the one uh, uh, linked to the uh, attempt of Putin to use the, uh, the energy as a weapon against our societies and to create a, an unsustainable situation in Europe. This is uh, not uh, a war for uh, regime change. Strictly speaking, it is not uh, a, a, a war, a, a support from Ukraine for uh, uh, democracy, for the promotion of democracy, although, of course, the survival of a democratic state will be important for democracy worldwide. And uh, I think it's a mistake to interpret and discuss uh, uh, this war in terms of a proxy war about the transformation of the future of the world order. There are similarities, of course, uh, but uh, the most uh, obvious similarities is the, the military expansionist uh, of the Nazi regime uh, that then trigger the Second World War. That said, two, two brief things about the, the future. Uh, it was important uh, to remind that there were some attempt before the war to uh, strike a deal or, or to have a meaningful negotiations which implies many things, in, including a de facto neutrality of Ukraine for uh, several years. And also, at the beginning of the war, you may remember, even President Zelensky proposed to open a negotiation that would uh, just uh, be uh, taken place after the withdrawal of the Russian uh, to the position before the war. And also, the, the issue of Crimea uh, could be taken outside of this negotiation for some time. So this was a reasonable position. Then came uh, Putin's decision to annex, to mobilize additional force under some defeats, and also to annex uh, four provinces, which was uh, a faithful decision that the, the dealt uh, a, a, a blow to the possibility of negotiation. This is something that is, uh, is forgotten. But I think that if, uh, in the case, Russia is defeated or uh, uh, is uh, again, uh, uh, there are some setbacks on the ground for Russia. Uh, this line, along these lines, it's possible probably to uh, start a, a meaningful negotiation. Second point uh, concerning the future of Ukraine after, after this war, if uh, it ends uh, uh, in the way I, I, we hope so. Uh, with the defeat of Russia on the ground. Uh, of course, that has been said, there is the need to find a different system, security system in Europe that necessarily should combine a deterrence uh, posture uh, by the West and security guarantees for, the, for Ukraine. But also, uh, I would say, this is of course a difficult proposition uh, because, of course, it's difficult now to think about the uh, uh, Ukraine membership in NATO, but at the same time uh, having a, an international format uh, for providing these security guarantees is also a, a, a difficult proposal to implement. But I will just underline that this system should imply also some measures or uh, confidence building measures and some measures of arms control because uh, of course, the entire security system in Europe has collapsed, and uh, European states are very much interested in restoring some form of uh, security confidence uh, system and also arms control in terms, for instance, regarding the conventional forces uh, 
in, on the continent. So uh, I think that these are the two pillars. On one hand, uh, negotiation will restart uh, if uh, there, are, there is a substantial change uh, on the ground. And this, uh, some of the proposals that have been uh, floated at the beginning of the war can uh, be uh, again uh, resurfaced and be the basis for the negotiation. And second, uh, we should completely, of course, rethink the security order in Europe, uh, trying to build a mix of new forms of deterrence and also arms control and uh, measures that can assure cooperation and confidence. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, Onke Onsan, the last speaker, I'll just make one announcement. We have put one microphone over there. This is for you to ask questions. So if you have a question, come to the microphone stand and then Please state your name and affiliation and raise a question. We would like to listen to your questions because we have a great panel of experts. So, oh, I would like oh, all the participants, you are such pundits. I mean, you are experts. I would like to ask you to raise questions. Thank you, Chairman. My starting point is that every coin has two sides. Even day to night, we are two different regimes, two different way of life. So as long as we have what we regard as one set of uh, governance system, and then there is another set of governance system, we will have this kind of situation where, yeah, there'll be one side pitch against the other. So I guess my starting point is, can we build some form of trust and coexistence for two different systems, two different governance regime to coexist? From what has happened so far in Ukraine, I don't think that is a near prospect. So we will just have to manage the differences. And my own prediction is that unless we are going to go to the absolute terrible option, there will be a frozen conflict situation in uh, Europe, in what is called Ukraine today, just like what we have in the Korean Peninsula, North and South Korea will be in a perpetual state of frozen conflict. Once in a while, something will be happening. There might be some anxiety and danger. And then at other times, due to diplomacy and other consideration, we can have a state of coexistence. So I have tried to make the point that uh, uh, there are institutions and processes and agreements that are already in place yeah, originally we have the UN, then things started to fall apart. But due to good leadership from uh, one country or another, uh, we go back to operating through the UN and other international organisations. So in uh, our region, uh, Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific, depending on what kind of terminology you want to use, we already have various forms of agreements. We already have institutions that can help us to manage the differences and try to form some uh, predictable way to coexist and work together. Currently, I don't see this happening in Ukraine or in the European theater. The gap is really too large to close and absolutely no trust between both sides. So, Chairman, I think this is going to carry on for a while. And we just have to hope that, yeah, 
clever diplomats, enlightened political leaders can try to keep things under control and not adopt any ultimate uh, option which could lead to real disaster for our humanity. The good thing is that, as we have heard from the various speakers before my uh, presentation and also the key keynotes delivered by the various other leaders earlier, there is uh, definitely a trend towards more innovation because of technology, because of digitalization. And so hopefully, yeah, the next generation yeah, can figure out how to coexist with the old style, the old ways, and absorb the danger or the challenges that we have uh, inherited and maybe create some new arrangements where uh, people from both sides of the spectrum can work towards some middle ground and coexist. So that's my uh, not so optimistic approach, but I guess yeah, it is one form of uh, trying to understand how we can go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know that uh, the panelists uh, would like to add to the initial comment, but uh, as I said, as I said at the outset, we're going to allow the people in the floor to make comments either in Japanese or English. Take advantage of this opportunity, and uh, brevity will be appreciated, be it a comment or question, please. If the mic is not on, could you turn the switch on? I'm uh, working, from a, uh, working for a bank in, in Tokyo. In Tokyo, and uh, I'm not advocating uh, regime change in Russia, but uh, there are rumors that the uh, Putin is uh, sick or, or he may be assassinated. If that happens, if Putin dies, let's say a month later, will Russia be uh, finishing this war or or is willing to uh, end this war? Uh, can somebody uh, Thank you. Then let's accept the next question. Thank you so much. My name is Takehito from Sofia University. My question will be about the role of higher education in this situation. The country is divided politically because of the national interest among countries, but I do believe International research collaborations across the countries, scientists and scholars are connected across the world. How higher education institutions can take a role diplomatically or scientifically to reconnect these divided regions across the world and then advance our research for the global challenges? Thank you. Hey, thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Kazu Togo. A uh, former member of the Japanese Foreign Ministry, uh, uh, and my, half of my career was uh, uh, devoted or related to Russia. And I have a specific question to the French represent, uh, 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 represent, representative. Do you think that there is a possibility to return to the Ukrainian proposal dated March the 29th, 2022? which seem to include all basic elements for agreement, including neutrality guarantee, but more importantly, fate of Crimea and Donbass, or that time is gone and the war continues until Ukraine, re Ukraine regains all the territory, including Crimea. Thank you. To whom are you addressing the question? The French person. <laughs> I, I, I don't know your name, so I'm sorry. Yeah. We have three questions. So what, what's going to happen if Putin dies? And a higher educational institution, what's the role? And to Toma-san, from Togo-san, there was a direct question. So the first question about President Putin's death. Anybody? Anybody who would like to address that question? Yeah. I remember when uh, Gorbachev came to the scene, 
there was this idea that perhaps yeah, two sides of the coin can become one piece of metal or one piece of uh, ornament. But at the end, you have all the other subsequent development. So I suppose that's the nature of politics and nature of civilizational uh, differences. So let's not hope for someone to die or <laughs> somebody else to come to the scene. Uh, we go back to the earlier panel discussion. Uh, the first panel uh, led by the, uh, Mr. Uh, Rohindan. Yeah. What are the institutions, what are the rules and values that can help to reconcile both sides? And I come from uh, the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Our constant challenge at higher education level is to try to bring people to reconcile the differences and hope to coexist. We can never say one will be better than the others, but perhaps we can build enough confidence and trust to work together. There will always be difference, but never mind. Uh, it doesn't mean that we cannot work together. Thank you. Fabrice uh, and Stefan. Fabrice and Stefan. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, I, think, I think the answer on Putin dying was, was the right one. I think this is speculatory and it cannot be obviously a strategy. But there was a, a question asked earlier about w whether Putin can be defeated. And without saying yes or no, let me give you three pointers. One, we have to look at Putin having moved the goalpost of what he has wanted to achieve in Ukraine quite considerably. It started as Kiev, he failed. Then it was the illegal annexation of four oblasts. He failed in controlling those four oblasts, including the capital of some of them. And now you hear about the notion that they want to control the Donbass. So actually, Putin has a great capacity to move down the goalpost first. Second, I think he can be deterred. He seems to be actually uh, um, more fearing Article 5 than some NATO allies trusting Article 5. He's never challenged Article 5. He's played around. He stayed below a certain threshold. But I think he takes Article 5 seriously. And when the US and others have sat down with their uh, Russian counterparts trying to draw a line in terms of not using the nuclear dimension or bringing the nuclear dimension into the conflict, I think it did work. So I think deterrence can work when we're willing to also put the means and the political commitments. And finally, I think the key is whether he will come to a point where he will have to choose between Kiev or Moscow. Whether what he's trying to achieve is threatening his own rule at home. And look, it took him six months to mobilize, Oops. to mobilize young Russian men, even though many in Moscow were telling him he had to do it. But he was reluctant to do it. Why? Because he knew it was going to touch the fabric, the political social fabric of the Putin system in Russia. And then what you have had, half a million young men who left Russia, were in Kazakhstan, in Georgia, in, in other parts, in other uh, regional countries, because they don't want to die for that war. So he knows, as a lot of autocrats know, that his rule is both very strong, but very weak at the same time. And I think if he comes to a point where, where his, his position in Moscow is potentially weakened or, 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 or threatened, he will have to, at some point, accept some form of defeat in Ukraine. That doesn't mean regime change. It just means re he will have, maybe at some point, to choose regime preservation against regime expansion. Thank you. Stefanson, Ettore-san, and uh, uh, also crayon -san. So, Stefanson, please. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You can't uh, uh, really have a strategy of replacing uh, Putin. But on the other hand, 
I think it's also worthwhile to speculate what might be the scenario when he is replaced, and then very much depends who is taking over. And uh, if he's replaced by a Kadir of a, a similar character, it might get worse. But if he's another um, person, then it might be easier for him to defeat, uh, to distance himself from the from the war and uh, to withdraw partially at least the troops and start negotiations. I think the worst case scenario is certainly. Um, a further disintegration of Russia via military um, scenario, uh, via civil war. This is certainly the worst case scenario we could uh, be confronted with. Thank you. Eto Rezan, I think the question, a uh, very speculative one, uh, about Putin uh, possibly leaving the scene uh, in a way or another, uh, allows us to emphasize again two important points. The first uh, is that uh, this was not, of course, uh, a war against Putin or for regime change again. And in fact, the uh, uh, Russian president was uh, accepted as a legitimate interlocutor until the very last moment. And there were a continuous attempt uh, at convincing him not to take this fa faithful decision. Second point, e even in the case uh, uh, he is replaced, there is a, uh, I think, a widespread conviction that a different leader not necessarily would be uh, ready to accommodate and to make concessions. Because at the moment, as a matter of fact, unfortunately, the, uh, the Russian population seems to be supportive of a, of a, a strategy to uh, continue this, uh, this war, and uh, uh, it depends very much on, on, about, on the circumstances in, in which uh, this uh, uh, possible ousting of uh, Putin will take place. Second, second point uh, regarding uh, nuclear deterrence. It's, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, these repeated uh, Russian nuclear threats uh, have not uh, prevented, this was their goal, in fact, uh, the Western countries uh, from uh, supporting militarily or even escalating the, their military support uh, to the Ukraine. But at the same time, we should recognize that this, um, the, the, the deterrence uh, post, that is nu the nuclear capabilities of Russia, have prevented the Western countries and the US uh, from being direct, directly involved in the war. And this is a message that is a very dangerous one because this means uh, that people, uh, the, the countries that uh, are confronting a threat from a nuclear country have just two possibilities. One is to join a military alliance uh, with a nuclear state and this is, of course, another, would be another factor of fragmentation and division of the world, or acquire the, they, they, they themselves nuclear weapons. So this is another factor we should take uh, into consideration because, of course, uh, for their implication for the non-proliferation regime and uh, how uh, and, the, and the relationship between nuclear and non-nuclear state and the bargain between them on which the non-proliferation regime is based. Thank you. Kryon San, please, yeah. and uh, then Jin san Thank you. I just yeah. wanted um, to respond very briefly to the question on education. So I think um, if you look at the international university system and the research system that links to it, I mean, it is the most extraordinary uh, international phenomenon that's being created. And it plays a tremendously important part in uh, developing technological responses to the global challenges. And you can see that in the, the very rapid development of vaccines. So although a lot of other issues to do with COVID were not working very well, what did work extremely well was the collaboration among scientists. And the same applies, I think, in relation to the solutions to uh, the green transition. But certainly in a number of countries, and it's certainly true in the UK, there is increasing concern around the national security implications of some aspects of this global research uh, uh, system. So there is concern about you know, Chinese students in the UK, uh, 
there's concern about um, specific technologies that may be regarded as of national security significance and you know, whether or not in some way they can be ring-fenced. And uh, what I would say is we just need to be really, really careful um, in looking at this uh, national security prism to make sure that we don't destroy something that actually is absolutely crucial to solving many of these global problems. So um, I, certainly when I worked in the national security side of our, our government, I was very, very keen to make sure that what was being identified as a national security risk really, really was a national security risk. Before, and that it, I'm sorry. And that it wasn't something um, which was something about strategic competition or whatever. I'll stop. Be before I give to Lindsay Sun, I think, uh, Thomas Sun, are you ready to answer the question you've been asked? Yeah, please. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, maybe on the first one, if I may, um, if Putin die, I don't think it's so speculative because he will die a day, like uh, all of us. Um, and maybe sooner than many of us. Um, but the interesting point is, um, how he does appear in the Russian system right now as a sort of centrist. Because the people who are promoted by the media at the time being are namely Prigozhin, uh, who announced that he's running for the presidency, not in Russia, but in Ukraine. And uh, Medvedev, former president, who was seen as uh, the modernized uh, guy, at that time, and who is now the most uh, vocal political leader, speaking until recently about, you know, the new nuclear step, for instance. So my point is just to say that um, if you have a, a very tricky equation, you should um, try to, to, to skip a factor. So let's skip the Putin's factor. And I do think that the equation, the system, uh, will produce some, someone very similar in the current circumstances. Now, the question uh, regarding you know, the, the agreement um, and the one which was uh, apparently prepared, um, and uh, ca can it be the starter, a new starter? Frankly speaking, I don't think so. For two, for, for two main reasons. First of all, the so-called Minsk agreement was decided when uh, Ukraine was in a desperate military situation in 2014. Yeah. And it was impossible to implement them because Ukrainians were asked to organize elections. And they said, we can't organize elections in Donbass having, you know, uh, Russian troops on the field. That's why it was blocked, namely. Second, um, the first uh, summit uh, in l'Elysée in 2019 with uh, Merkel, Macron, Putin, and Zelensky, just elected, was a turning point because Zelensky at that time was seen as a, uh, uh, mainly as a Russian-speaking clown by the others, but he was not. He was elected uh, and supported by some oligarchs, given you know, the organization of the Ukrainian political system. But there is a big change with Zelensky you know, uh, since February 2022, 2000, uh, since 2019, as I said, but more uh, clearly since February 2022, when he was offered to escape the country by Americans, and he said, no, no, no. I don't need a cab, you know. I need some. I need some weapons. And it became uh, a statement, you know, since since that day. Have a look about, you know, there is no more um, big oligarchs, you know, playing the game right now in Ukraine, given the circumstances of um, of war. So I don't think it can be a starting point. I think that the, the next starting point uh, should try to elaborate on the four main points. First of all, as we said the rapport de force uh, on the field. And on that, you're right. I don't, f I don't know if it's possible for Ukrainians to recover Crimea, for instance. It's, it's an open question. I have no, no precise idea on that. The level of damage, 
because the damage are on the Ukrainian soul with the destruction of civilian infrastructure plus the refugees. The damage are not on the Russian soil. Uh, the nature of NATO and EU support to Ukraine. And last but not least, the nature of support uh, of the Russian positions by uh, other players, namely China or, possi or possibly also some CSO uh, members. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the last speaker I have is uh, Lin Zhe San. Uh, could you finish it in two minutes? The only reason I say is that uh, the only reason that I'm asked by Mr. Kudo to sort of chair this meeting is I'm a good timekeeper. And uh, it's, we only have two minutes left, so please uh, finish it in two minutes. Thank you very much. Happy to do so, Mr. Ambassador. On the question of what would happen if Vladimir Putin died, I think the only answer is we do not know. We do not know who would succeed him, uh, what choices they would make, or how long they would last. It is possible that someone could seize power and uh, establish a long reign. It's possible that uh, Russia could go through uh, basically a period of considerable instability. Uh, I'm not sure which of those outcomes is more troubling. I would actually, though, ask people to think about a different uh, hypothetical, and that is what if Vladimir Putin were to make it clear he's now willing to negotiate? Now, I said before that the context for negotiations is not auspicious. I did mean to imply or suggest that negotiations are impossible. My sense is the United States government is keeping its ears open for any feelers from the Russians about uh, entering into negotiations. And we tend to think, of, well, if we have negotiations, it's all downhill and things will unfold uh, quite easily. And I think actually uh, thinking through negotiations, uh, you immediately come into a series of very difficult questions. And I'll just pose two of them. Who gets to do negotiating and what are they negotiating over? I think assumption we often have is that it'll be Russia and Ukraine. I'm not so sure that Mr. Putin will want to negotiate with Ukraine. He wants to negotiate with the United States because he sees the United States as the real power. My sense is the United States would not be eager to get in a position which it's negotiating on behalf of the Ukrainians. Moreover, the issue simply wouldn't be about Ukraine and borders. Uh, it's going to be, as I think a Tory uh, quite rightly pointed out, the broader question of European security going forward. And as you broaden that question, then lots of other countries uh, have a real uh, interest in what happens there. So I think there are really big questions on that. Finally, and this goes back to the excellent point that Kudosan made, if you begin to think about uh, a peace settlement, uh, Ukraine is clearly going to want uh, guarantees because it's gonna, it's, it fears that if it stops fighting, that after 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, the Russians come back. So you're going to need really tough security guarantees. The question is, uh, what guarantees are going to be, or guarantors are going to be acceptable to both sides? And I think that is quite problematic. Uh, Ukrainians might want the Americans to be there. I can guarantee you the Russians will not want the Americans to be there. Uh, then the question becomes, okay, who has the capacity in the will to put troops there, and they're gonna have to be there a long time. And I think when you start going through the list of countries with credible capability, it's a pretty short list, and it gets even shorter when you realize, for a variety of reasons, those countries won't be acceptable to one country or another, so. I think uh, you're done right. Uh, I think uh, Russians will try to bind the arms of Ukrainians and try to limit the, uh, restrict the ammunition and things like that, but uh, we have to be very sort of uh, firm and uh, not let those uh, conditions uh, go. We have history in Japan uh, of, uh, well, that's uh, 300 years ago uh, or so. Uh, one regime of Toyotomi was destroyed by Tokugawa because of those uh, uh, filling in the Moto ditches. And uh, so we really know that. 
this is a very important point. Thank you very much. Uh, it was not only enlightening and informative, but uh, very thought-provoking. And let us all give a big applause to these excellent panelists. Ambassador Fuzisaki, thank you very much. And we are going to finish this uh, session one. Thank you very much.